our service here this morning and also say a word of welcome to those who are joining us at home as well. It's great to have Mr. Colin Miller along with us this morning and Colin we look forward to your message to us in the service. There's just a few announcements to make you aware of. Um, next Friday at 7.30 the bowling club will continue in the hall and then next Sunday is our harvest weekend and uh, our harvest service will be here in the morning at 10.30 and the Reverend David Mullen will be along to take the service uh, in the morning time and then at 7 o'clock in the evening the Reverend Bobby Loney will be back to uh, lead the service at night. I think there's maybe a few of the ladies would like maybe to have a quick chat afterwards just about talking about decorations and whatnot uh, for inside the church here next Sunday. So these are all the announcements you make in Mandarin and Prayer. It's lovely to, um, to be back in within the, the Glenady congregation. Uh, it's funny how we're able to tell time and tell back, uh, look back in history now. Uh, isn't it that we're taught in schools, wasn't it? Isn't it BC and AD? Uh, before Christ and, and Anno Domini. Uh, I think we've, we've learned now to tell history uh, a little bit differently now. BC tends to be now before Covid. Uh, AD, um, somebody, somebody smarter than me told me the other day that AD now is uh, after digital took over the church. Uh, I know we were, we were talking about just uh, how much reliant we are now on technology, um, but it's also a really good thing. Actually, it's a really good thing for those of you that are here within the congregation that are sat more than two pews back uh, because you're behind the camera. Um, for everyone else who's at home, uh, the camera obviously helps you this morning to be a part of our service and you're very welcome as part of that. I hate being on this side of the camera though, I've got to say. Uh, if I had any choice in the matter, I would always have been, uh, I think it, uh, something my mum taught me, we tend to stay behind the camera, behind the lens or behind the phones they are taking the cameras and let much uh, more influential or much better looking people stay on uh, this side of the camera. But it's great to be able to share with you both in person here this morning. It's great for me to be able to hear live music uh, being played as part of worship. Um, but we welcome you at home as well, wherever you are, whether it's at home, uh, traveling, uh, and using the technology that there is to be a part of us. We, we gather together, whether it's in person uh, or whether it is virtually, uh, to worship God this morning. We set aside our time on this Sunday morning to rejoice and to, to make that choice to rejoice in God's power, joining with the ancient praise of all God's people. The words of Psalm 17 say, I am praying to you because I know you will answer, O oh God. Bend down and listen as we pray. Show me your unfailing love in wonderful ways. By your mighty power, you rescue those who seek refuge from their enemies. So we choose to worship God knowing that God bends down to, to listen as we pray and as we worship. We sing together um, our opening hymn this morning, O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Let's worship together. <laughs>
been sung uh, our acknowledgement of our mighty and wonderful God. We respond also now knowing that God does, in the words of the psalmist, bend down and listen. God turns his ear towards us this morning. So let us pray together. Heavenly Father, at the, the start of our worship this morning, at the start of our time gathering together to acknowledge you in your power and your might, we're grateful for your presence with us. We great, we're grateful for uh, your history with us. We're grateful for the ways in which we can know the story of you from ancient times, responding to your people, calling your people, rescuing your people, placing your people in the midst of, of your creation, at the very heart of it, you in relationship with, with your creation and with your people. From everlasting, you are God. who was, who is, who is yet to come. We're grateful, but it is beyond our, our thinking at times that a thousand ages in your sight are like an evening gone. But in the midst of, of the passing of time, you are gracious to us. You turn toward us, you hear us. You respond to us, you call us. And so we turn as a people very grateful that you have been our help in ages past. That you are and you remain our guard while the troubles last. And that in you is our eternal home. In the stillness of our mornings, whether it be part of this congregation, whether it be in our homes, we welcome the stillness and how that he presents with us. Give us within us an awareness of your spirit to seek you and wisdom to find you today. May our ears hear your voice, our eyes see your gifts to please in you. And so we join from individuals to one family using the words that Jesus said, thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. We forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I don't wear glasses yet, and I do use the word yet very deliberately. I suspect if I visited Specsavers, they might have something different to say as to whether I should be or not. But I find myself um, every other evening or whatever, lifting up uh, my son Joshua's glasses, um, usually lifting them from somewhere where they shouldn't be to put them where they should be. And as I'm doing so, I'm looking at them and they're covered in marks and grime and all sorts and you can usually tell what he's been doing through the day by what's on his glasses. Now I wouldn't go so far as to say there's food on it but I would go so far as to say whatever food he's been eating with his hands during the day have normally found traces on them. It'd be something that if you were a forensic scientist all you'd probably need is to lift a pair of glasses to tell where he's been, what he's done, what he's been eating. And I will probably get in trouble for saying that when I get home later on. 
But our glasses give us a window into our world. The windows around our church building are great in that the way that when the sun shines in, and you will know this building better than others, that as it spends the day traveling from that part of the, the church building around the outside, um, those of you who've chosen your seats wisely know where the seats are so that you don't get blinded. You'll also choose your seats according to who's taking the service in the morning because you're thinking, if it's going to be a long one, then I can't sit in the back seat because the sun will hit that seat. It's a little bit like a sundial working our way through. But uh, you can't actually see out through these windows very clearly. It's great being on the inside, but you don't get a chance to see what's on the outside. So for those of you maybe at home, it might be easier for you to look out a window and to see what it is you can see outside the window. Or for those of you that are here, it's a matter of thinking to yourself, have you taken the time to look outside a window this morning to see what's outside it? It may be that you just have a window that looks onto the gable wall of another house and there's not a lot to see until the cracks in your neighbor's house start to appear and you need to go and tell them about that. It may be that you have a view just out into a little cul-de-sac where you live. You may be really fortunate in that you may have, uh, like I have a bit of a, like a kitchen window that looks directly west. So in the evening I can see between two or three houses there's a gap that allows us to see the sun going down and the colour of the sky goes in the, the west. Or it may be that you are remarkably fortunate in that every window around your house looks out over green fields, over trees, over the lock, uh, to see what you can see. Through the summer, um, we as a family had to spend some time uh, self-isolating under the, the old guidance. And uh, I found myself getting to the end of those 10 days absolutely bored, silly, and I put on some daytime TV. There was a program called Escape to the Country, I'm sure many of you don't know Escape to the Country, because if you do, goodness me, we need to find better TV to be watching during the day. But it's a program that looks at, at couples or families who've been living within an, an urban environment, trying to find that ideal home somewhere in the countryside. And the, the couple that I, that I remember watching um, had five different specifications that they wanted to find their ideal home. But... The first house that they went to, suddenly three of those criteria just went out the window, so to speak, because they were caught with the view that they had, with what they could see from that house. Suddenly they said that that was it. And they ended up within about 100 metres of that same first house living there because it was the view was the thing. And they said, uh, there was a phrase that they used, that the view will keep us living here for all of our days. Because there was something within what they could see that gave them that hope, that strength, that encouragement, that daily get up and go. Or that evening, sitting and chilling, unwinding and being able to be grateful for it. So I wonder what it is you can see out your window. I wonder, have you got a window that you can look out, see something, and be grateful for what you see? So in your mind's eye, or if you're, if you're at home, I'd like you just to think about that window and what you see outside of it that you're grateful for. Whether it is something that gives you just a sense of peace at the end of the day, whether it is something that brings you brightness at the start of the day, whether it is watching neighbours, whether that is just assurance that they are there or whether it is laughter at, at the antics that, that we get up to. The things that we're grateful for We also use, don't we, uh, there is now, uh, whether we, we like it or not, our phones become a window into our world. Um, our phones with the pictures that, they are that we take and with the pictures that we share, 
and um, become the window into our days that we show to others to allow them to see it. My daughter is spending this year um, studying in Russia um, and I'm learning very, very slowly and very, very badly even just to recognize the letters of the Russian alphabet, never mind speaking it yet. But she has a, an Instagram account that every day she's posting pictures to that allows us to see into her world. Now what she may not recognize is for us as parents, we're just glad to see pictures of her because we know she's alive and she's well. But she's showing us pictures of, of the things that she sees, the things she's doing, people she's meeting, but more than in the places that she's visiting. And it's stunning. We're not there, but we have that window into her world. And for us, that's a source of our gratitude. That's a source for us to give thanks. One of the things I'll be doing today, actually, I know it's coming in, and I don't know if you've seen, um, you are aware that this is an anniversary weekend within your church building, I'm sure. Because as I noticed coming in, the three foundation stones outside are for the 10th of October, let's see if I can remember this right, 1891, which I think makes it 130 years ago today that the foundation stones were laid within this building. So I've got a photograph of it that I took. I think I might have to take another one in less of a hurry. And to share that just as part of my day. But we thank God for it. Jesus said to his disciples, look at the birds of the air to use their eyes. And in, in, in what they saw, they don't sow, they don't reap, they don't store away in barns. And yet, as you watch them, as you look out, your heavenly father feeds them. And Jesus said to those around him, to those following, are you not more valuable than they are? Who of you by worrying can add a, a single R to your life or a, a single cubit to your height? So let's use our windows this day, in fact leading ahead into our harvest next weekend, just to be grateful and to be thankful. To use the windows of our glasses, the windows of our windscreens in our cars, the windows of our homes to look out and to say, God, thank you. We're going to sing uh, our thankfulness uh, as part of our worship uh, and as part of our recognizing. So with that image of what you see out your window, and even if you're at home and you're able just to look out the windows as you sing this, so we sing, great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thank you.
time uh, is taken from the Old Testament. Uh, it's from the, the, the second collection of Chronicles in chapter 20. Uh, now, it is quite a lengthy reading, um, so you'll have to just bear with me uh, if you want to follow it through, uh, whether it's or whatever. So it's second Chronicles chapter 20 and verses 1 to 30. Uh, and I think... Uh, if I, if I actually manage to get all the way to 30 verses, our time might be up by the time we get to that. So we'll see how far we, we get and how we do with this. It's entitled within uh, this translation of the, the Bible, Jehoshaphat defeats Moab and Ammon. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, with some of the Munites, came to make war on Jehoshaphat. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the sea. It is already in Hazan Tamar, that is in Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord, in the front of the new courtyard, and said, and here's the first of his prayers, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. O our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. But now, here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. Well, see how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeliel, the son of Marat, the son of Mataniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them, they will be climbing up by the pass of Zeus, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jericho. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Jehoshaphat bowed with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and the Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. 
After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they were out as they went out at the head of the army saying give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever as they began to sing and praise the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated the men of Ammon and Moab rose up against the men from Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked towards the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. On the fourth day they assembled in the valley of Barak where they praised the Lord and that is why it is called the valley of Barak to this day. Then led by Jehoshaphat all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lutes and trumpets. The fear of the Lord came upon all the kingdoms of the countries when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace for God had given him rest on every side. We give thanks to God for this history and for the, our window into it. The last time I was here was BC before COVID. And at the start of the, the pandemic, um, as things started to develop and as our understanding grew, um, my family made plans as to what we would do should anyone within our family have a, a positive result or, or develop COVID or be contacted uh, or identified as a close contact. And we worked hard through our work environment, through schools, through our family connections, through social things, through everything, as everybody did, to ensure that we minimise the risk of any of that happening. But in the midst of the summer, uh, all of our efforts fell apart, which resulted in us as a family all having to isolate. And as was typical for us, it was a complicated and an unpredictable story. And I guess as a, as a family, we had feelings of frustration, annoyance, disappointment, and, and fear, really, as all of our foundations that we had built appeared vulnerable. The question we were left with then was, well, how do we respond when the grounds that we had trusted in, when the plans that we had put in place, proved not to be a firm place to stand? And we spent uh, in, in totality, I think it was, I spent about 20 days with all the way that, that our family situation developed, looking out the windows to see what we could see. And through those nearly three weeks, I guess I grew much more aware of what was outside of our windows. Things to be thankful for, but also creating a, a jobs list of things to be done when we were all out. As I watched the grass growing and thinking, it was going to need a, a farmer to come to, to cut our grass, never mind our little lawnmower by the time we were done. But that same question about, not about cutting the grass, but about how to respond when the grounds we place our trust in proves not to be a firm place to stand. That was the same question that the Chronicles tackled. The audience had seen all that they once held dear and built their life upon had shattered. For those reading the Chronicles story, their enemy Babylon had leveled their cities, laid waste their land, 
unshackled their wrists. Worst of all, the temple that they had, the temple that this story spoke about, had actually been demolished before their eyes. The very symbol of faith and security had been leveled. The exiles were devastated. Some had given up on their faith, others had married into other religions. And the question on everyone's mind was, who are we now that our identity, our security, our foundations are gone? The pandemic that we have and to an extent still are traveling through has for many individuals and communities demolished identity and means of operating. And we're aware of the, the multiple reports that discuss the impact on physical, economic, social, mental, emotional health. Schools uh, advise that guidance for planning would be available and by the end of September, find ourselves scrambling at the end of August, um, aware that the landscape wasn't sufficiently clear for any planning to go on in July and August. The chronicler writing these, these stories had no perspective at the time to allow hope, probably written during or shortly after the people had been taken into exile. And the story of Judah that was told through the, these chronicles was a dark place of instability and of God's people repeatedly forgetting or turning away from God. With the odd stories, the odd periods of, of spiritual reformation coming through. So the chronicler reminded the exiles reading this story saying, listen you who live in shaky times with sinking sand all around you, this is your story. In this portion of the story, the, the direction, the imperative given was to stand firm in wobbly places of fear. In fact, within this chapter, I think it's something like nine or ten times, some form of the word for standing is used. I did think at one stage, uh, Actually, it was, it was the last night of Friday of, of, of thinking we could all just stand all the way through the reading and taking the words on board. But then I thought, when I remember, I remember there's 30 verses, I thought, I will struggle, never mind everyone else who's expecting to sit this morning. But they are told, and, and there, there are for me three pictures there of standing firm and what it looks like. More importantly, though, than, than how we stand firm is where we stand firm, isn't it? The first picture of standing firm was King Jehoshaphat's reaction to the enemy threat. Like everyone, he was scared. But he doesn't scramble to forge a treaty or order arms or find an alliance. No, this king within our history calls the community to pray their fears, to express their fears. It's no, it's no, um, great press conference that says there are difficulties but but we'll be fine, we get through it, we've got all of these reserves here in place and there's no uh, press briefing thing every evening from Downing Street or from, from the palace. Instead he calls the people to the temple and they pray their fears. All the people gathered at the temple and the king prayed. He did start by acknowledging God's rule and promises and then just laid out the situation. Ruled out almost like the map before them to say, well, look, this country, they weren't destroyed when we came in. They're now coming in after us. This country, we left them in peace when we were given this land. They're coming in. And up on the mountains over here, guess what? They're coming as well. And it would have been to some extent as we call it within our family, it would have been a bit of a Billy Bad News, just or, or Dr. Doom, laying out all of that. He's laid the story of who God is, but he's saying, this is where we are. And his, his ending words were, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. So often, we've learned, haven't we, to minimize our fears and, and to deny their power. And I understand a lot of that because it helps us keep 
some sort of mental strength uh, about us. I came listening to the radio this morning. Today, uh, it is today, I think, was it? I might have misheard. I think today's Mental Health Awareness Day. And a lot of it was about getting people to sit to talk to one another. And as I sat there, I thought, yeah, we talk to one another, but, but as people of faith, it's also about us being able to express and to say, God, here are my fears. The king doesn't maximize his fear. He doesn't simply go down that dooms thinking it's the whole story. He doesn't hide away from it thinking our God is a mighty God. There is nothing to fear. He does a bit of both. He acknowledges fear and he looks to God. He prays his fear. His standing firm is saying, God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. That's standing firm. The second picture is God's response. From verse 14, uh, it reads that, and there were all the names within it. I keep thinking, I wonder would they find our names as awkward? Would they find it as awkward to talk about Charlotte, to talk about Nigel, to talk about Colin, as I find it talking about Jehaziel, Zachariah, Benaniah, Jael, and I hope they do, because I'm grateful for the story, but I trip over the names. But he comes and says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Uh, he was a, a worship leader from a long line of worship leaders. And he said, do not be afraid or discouraged, for the battle is not yours, but God's. You won't have to fight. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord gives you. These words are, are almost identical words to spoken in, in another place. At the Red Sea, the Israelites coming out of Egypt, standing at the sea line, Pharaoh and the army, again, are starting to surround them on all sides, coming towards them to pull them back into slavery, making a beeline for them to, to wipe them out. But God promised them, don't be afraid, stand firm. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. In Exodus chapter 14. And Jehoshaphat's people will then reflect through that, that, those same words and remember the wall of waves that came crashing down on Pharaoh and the army. They remember the threat that was drowned under God's own ambush in the waters uh, of the sea. They remember Miriam on the other side singing, the Lord is my strength and my song. The Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. And Jehoshaphat's people, when they hear the Lord's assurance of salvation coming to them, when they remember the Moses story, they burst into songs of praise. Yahweh hasn't done anything but give his word, but they react as if the battle is already won. Had I been there, I wonder would I, how I would have responded to them. Would I have joined with those songs of praise already saying the battle is won? Or would I have been the, the one muttering at the side saying, isn't this a bit premature? Um, they're still coming. They're still there. They're still, I can still see the flags. I can still see the smoke from the fires rising. They're still knocking at our gates. But for the king who prostrated himself and for the assembly who fell down in worship, for them, standing firm was trusting in those words and laying themselves prone before God. And thirdly, Jehoshaphat then went a step further. He put his military where his mouth was. He put the worship leaders at the front at the head of the army. And as an outrageous song, the, the people of God stood firm in confidence and they sang of their trust in God. What better ways? It is written, isn't it, within our, I can't remember, it's not in our hymns and psalms, I think it was the Methodist hymn book, is it that Methodism was born in song. Wesley understood that there was something probably way ahead of even our thinking, and I might have to go back to it, that there is something about singing our praises that helps shift our faith, our confidence, 18 inches either from our mouths 
up or from our mouths down into our hearts, that by singing our faith, it emboldens us, it helps remind us who God is and gives us that strength. And as the praise of God ascended, God set down ambushes in the midst of the people. And in a classic pattern from, from our stories, the enemies panicked and destroyed one another. They set upon each other and destroyed each other. Imagine you are the worship leader, put at the front to sing trust, but you don't know what's going to happen. Sure, yet God, 700 years ago, parted the water in front of those who sat stood in the, 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 the water to, to see it part as they praised God. But they sang, give thanks to the Lord for his, he is good. And as they made that nerve wracking turn at the end of the gorge to overlook the desert, expecting there to be armies and a, 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 an absolute launch of, of arrows and spears coming their way, instead they see the devastation of an army that's been set upon themselves. Thousands slain in the desert, the enemy already defeated, and the song changes, the shout goes up to say that Yahweh is a warrior, the battle is his, his love stands firm forever. And that place that could have been Death Valley, the people expecting it to be the valley of their death, instead of it being the valley of death where the, the enemies had set upon themselves, became the valley of Baraka, the valley of the blessing of the Lord. Praise is all over the story. Praise before the battle, praise during the battle, praise after the battle. Praise is all over the story because it is the story about God. Because it's about him. The people stand firm by not denying their fear or getting swallowed up in their fear. Instead, they pray their fear. The people stand firm as they remember God's word and they stand firm by singing their trust. They're not standing on their own work or prayers or praises or their resources. They're standing firm in God. It's about the one who fights for them. That's what our gospel is all about. We stand firm in his work and not our own. Our warrior God squared up and conquered death and sin and that ancient foe of death. And that's the reality we now stand firm in. If we try to stand firm in our vocation, our relationships, our health, our understanding, we'll find ourselves with quicksand. We'll find ourselves losing jobs, losing relationships, losing everything we have, devastated, because that's what our security was, our identity was, game over. But if we stand firm in the Lord, when that battle comes, we're still okay because our identity and our security are in Him. I close with this story of a, a writer, Henry Nguyen, who was fascinated by a group of trapeze artists. Many of our, our young people may not actually understand just what trapeze artists are. Go look up YouTube trapeze, they're great. But there was a troop of trapezes called the Flying Rodleys. And one day he asked the chief of the Flying Rodleys how he managed to fly through the air and still catch on to the other person on the swing. The answer was this. The secret is that the flyer does nothing and the catcher does everything. When I fly to Joe, I simply just stretch out my hands and arms and wait for him to catch me and pull me safely over the apron behind the catch bar. The worst thing the flyer can do is to try to catch the catcher. I'm not supposed to catch Joe. It's Joe's task to catch me. If I grabbed his wrists, I might break them, or he might break mine, and that'll be the end for both of us. A flyer must fly, and a catcher must catch. And the flyer must trust, with outstretched arms, that his catcher will be there for him. These images give depth of understanding of what Jesus meant in that hour of his death, when he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. 
Father, into your hands we offer ourselves and our lives. Confident in you, the warrior God, the catcher God. And maybe this week, instead of simply talking to God about our troubles, we may talk to our troubles about God. Let us pray. Lord God, the God of our ancestors, you are the God in heaven. You rule over the nations and the power and might are in your hand. This morning we look to all of you that we can know, see and know and declare your greatness in the midst of struggles. This morning we pray for our, our family, for those in difficult and dark places, for those who find themselves in, in quicksand, with difficulties in relationships, in families, those with difficulties in, in work environments, those with difficulties within their own thinking. We remember with gratitude how you have caught us in the past. And with each memory, with each bit of gratitude, we say, you did it before, you can and you will do it again. We thank you for the history of, of this family within Glenavy. Through more than 130 years, but through 130 years within this building, We're grateful, but we also say, God, what you have done before, you can and you will continue to do. Help us to live these days to the full, being true to you in every way. Help us to give ourselves away to others. And help us to, to love the lost, proclaiming Jesus in all that we do and all that we say. And we say, thank you. Amen. And so we, uh, we sing together as we draw together this time together. Uh, a little bit of where we started, asking God to be our vision, that whatever we look out through, whether it's spectacles, windows, windscreens, that God will be our vision, Lord of our hearts.
blessing on each of us, asking God for faith to see him. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.